Dear Rector, dear colleagues, guests, and students, I would like to welcome you to the last of 60th anniversary lecture series of METU. In this academic year, we are celebrating 60th anniversary of METU with a series of activities, including honorary lecture series. It's an honor and a great pleasure for me to introduce to you Professor Dr. Martin Green. I thank you for accepting our invitation. Martin Green is a distinguished scientist and researcher in the field of science and technology of solar energy conversion and energy storage. He is the founder of photovoltaic uh, research group of University of New South Wales, which is now the largest and most widely known university-based group worldwide in this field. He is also director of the Australian Centre for Advanced Photovoltaics. His group's contributions to photovoltaics include development of the world's highest efficiency silicon solar cells and commercialization of several different cell technologies. He is sometimes called as the father of photovoltaics. Dr. Green received his PhD on a Commonwealth scholarship at McMaster University in Canada in 1974 at the University of South, New South Wales he initiated the solar photovoltaic groups, which soon worked on the development of silicon solar cells. His group developed first 20% efficient silicon solar cell in 1985, leading to the invention of 15 years world best silicon solar cell with an efficiency of 25%. He's the inventor of Perk cell, now the solar cell produced in the second highest volume commercially today. And he is co-inventor of buried contact solar cells, co-inventor of laser doped selective emitter solar cells. Dr. Green is the head of team holding present world records for performance of both silicon and non-silicon solar modules, and co-inventor of poly polycrystalline silicon tin film on glass technology. He has also made significant contribution to the energy storage. He is the initiator of redox uh, battery work, resulting in the invention of vanadium redox ba battery. Dr. Green has received many awards, prizes, and medals. I would like to mention some of them. I cannot list all of them. It's too long. Pauci Medal from Australian Academy of Science, Edgeworth David Medal from Royal Society of uh, New South Wales, and Award for Outstanding Achievement in Energy Research, William Cherry Award from IEEE, the Eureka Prize, External Prize awarded by Commonwealth Scientific and Industry Research Organization, Surgeon Medal for Highly Significant Contributions Through Technical Innovations, Ebers Award Model Award, Ebers Award by International Electron Device Meeting and Australian Achiever by the National Australia Day Council, Australian Prize, uh, Sir Hook Award, Medal of Engineering Excellence for Distinguished Achievement in Service of Humanity, 2000 Millennium Award by World Renewable Energy Network Congress, hum Humboldt Foundation Research Award, Inaugural Federation Fellowship, awarded by Prime Minister of Australia, Right Livelihood Award known as Sweden's Alternative Nobel Prize presented by Swedish Parliament, and Carl Boer Solar Energy Medal of Merit, World Technology Award for Energy, Energy Inventor of the Year, Solar World Einstein Award, and the finalist of Zayat Future Energy Prize. So this is a partial list of uh, awards and medals he has uh, received. He held honorary degrees and professorships at various universities, including Hua Zhong University, McMaster University, Fusu University, Hubei University of Technology. Dr. Green is the author of seven books, 25 book chapters, numerous reports, patents, and conference papers, and over 500 papers in internationally refer refereed journals. He is one of the most cited scientists in the world. In 2014 and 15, he was ranked in the top 1% of most cited researchers in the engineering for years of publications between 2002 and 2012. 
No, it's a great honor for me to present Dr. Green to you to give his talk. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for that very uh, comprehensive analysis. I'm, I'm sure you did list every single award I've ever received, but thank you very much. Yes, I'm, I'm Martin Green, and um, I'm director of this Australian Centre for Advanced Photovoltaics, uh, based in uh, Sydney, but involving uh, research groups from six Australian universities and research institutes. I'm based myself at the University of New South Wales in Sydney. Um, so what I'd like to talk to you today is um, about a technology that's starting to spearhead a revolution that we're going to see in the way that energy is generated worldwide, and that's the use of these photovoltaic solar cells. I've been involved in the field for many decades, as was mentioned in the introduction, but it's only now, over the last couple of years, that it's become very clear that this is a technology that's going to provide a large amount of energy that the world's going to use in the future. So um, in the past, most of our electricity has been generated from fossil fuels, such as this coal generator shown here. But in the future, an increasing amount is going to be developed by photovoltaic panels, as shown here. In the past, this has been too expensive. Um, but uh, as we see, the costs have come down very rapidly. And um, now it's becoming one of the lowest cost options for electricity production and certainly will be, um, you know, over the coming decades. So what's a solar cell look like? Um, this is a solar, called a solar panel, which is a, a package that containing the solar cells that are shown here. So each package contains about 60 or 70 solar cells that are shown. Um, the, the black things you can see are silicon wafers. Um, so the, um, the photovoltaic cells use technology that was originally developed for microelectronics because um, the silicon chips and so on that are powering the computers and the, your iPhones and whatever, um, you use very similar technology to that used, that's used in the solar cells, except uh, with solar cells the emphasis is rather than getting the size small, it's getting the size big so you can cover large areas of land um, with the technology. So these are, these are silicon wafers into which the cell is built. The cells are then connected together in a package like this called a module. And then as long as the sun is shining on this module, you'll generate electricity between the, the positive and negative terminals of that module. And it'll act pretty much like a battery, like a car battery or an iPhone battery, as long as the sunlight is uh, shining on the module. So quite simple to use, although the technology and physics that go into uh, describing how the cell works are quite complicated. So as long as the sun is shining on the module, you'll be able to draw electrical power from it. So pretty much the same as a car battery. Um, this is a diagram of what happens within the cell. So the sunlight falls on the cell and then creates um, charge carriers within the cell that then give rise to this electrical output. But uh, to understand how the cell works, you need to take advantage of some of the key developments and understanding that occurred in the 20th century. You know, so first of all, it was the, the, the improved understanding of the nature of light. So by the beginning of the 20th century, physicists thought that it had all been sorted out and everyone understood that light was a wave. And then Albert Einstein came along and, and to describe the way that light interacts with matter, you had to postulate that light in fact uh, acted as if it was made up of tiny particles. So this, this uh, then led to the development of quantum mechanics and the, um, the complete revolution in physics that uh, we saw during the 20th century. So um, in some applications light can be thought of as a wave, in others including in solar cells you think of the light falling on the cell as particles. So these, um, these particles making up the sunlight enter the, um, the silicon material. This is looking at a cross section of one of these cells here. So you've got metal contacts on the front that you might just be able to see in this, in this image here. And then a metal contact to the back and um, you generate the electrical output between this front and the back contact. So the light um, 
enters the, the um, silicon material, and this is where the particle type nature of the light comes into account. Each particle of the light with sufficient energy can release um, electrons from the chemical bonds within the silicon material. So this releases the charge carriers that um, give rise to that battery type effect. The, so the other feature that's included into the cell is what's called a positive-negative junction. And uh, this was the other big development in, in physics in the 20th century. So this is William Shockley who received the 1956 Nobel Prize um, for his um, development of the understanding of these positive-negative junctions in particular. So when you introduce impurities into the silicon material, you can change the electronic properties of the material. And um, William Shockley here realised that this would give rise to new types of devices that in fact have underpinned the microelectronics revolution and so on. So the uh, development of quantum physics was also very important to understanding how these uh, junctions could allow you to manipulate the properties of the silicon material. The reason that you need a PN junction in a solar cell is when the light releases these charge carriers, you want them all to go off in the same direction. And the PN junction, positive-negative junction, introduces that directionality into the um, motion of the uh, generated charge carriers. So the sunlight falls on the cell, releases charge carriers, then the PN junction forces the negative charges to move off in one direction and the positive ones to move off in the other. And hence you get the, uh, you, you can draw output from the cell terminal. So it's very simple operationally, you just put the cell out in the sunlight, but to understand what's going on within the cell, you need some of the key developments in physics that have occurred during the, um, the 20th century. Okay, um, the early applications of the cells, um, that they, they found quite immediate applications in telecommunications. So this is a photo that I took in the early 1980s in Outback Australia. And the solar panels were quite expensive then, and, but still they were cheap enough to use in this type of application where you needed small amounts of electricity in areas where there weren't any traditional electricity supplies. So the, the sun uh, shone on these cells that generated electricity that then went to a bank of chemical batteries in this sh shipping container here. And then this powered uh, telecommunication uh, uh, antenna shown here. So the, the uh, radio signals would be sent from a, na a tower about 30 kilometres away to this tower here. Then they'd be amplified by the electronics um, in this box here and then retransmitted line of sight to the next power. And still, if you, if you make a phone call to Outback Australia, your telephone <coughs> signal is actually still sent along these um, repeater stations through the Outback. But, um, you know, this was the early 80s. I've been involved from the 70s, as was mentioned in the introduction, so, you know, even this application was sort of new at, in that era. But uh, even back then, we, we thought about long-term applications. And this was a demonstration system that went in in the early 80s in the US, where the idea was initially, this is a nuclear station in California that was closed down many years ago. But uh, the idea was to uh, install large amounts of photovoltaics in the isolation zone around the nuclear power plant to, um, you know, to provide, to complement the nuclear plant uh, electricity. But this was just a demonstration system then because the cells were far too expensive to be used in that type of application. But since then, the cost of the cells have been steadily coming down and the applications they can be used for have kept expanding. So this was an application that was particularly popular in Australia and that's providing electricity for private homes. So um, this is a, a small system that provides about a third of the electricity of a, of a standard home. And um, uh, there were incentive schemes uh, at various parts of the world, uh, particularly in Germany, but also in Australia, um, to promote the, the use of solar in this type of application, which quickly dro drove down the costs of installing them and so on. And uh, this became quite a large application. So a few years back, Australia had a, a million systems like this installed on private homes. Um, so that might not that might sound like a lot or not very 
not very many, but Australia is quite a, has a, quite a small population. So there's only about 8 million homes, private homes in Australia. So this is one home in eight by 2013 had, had its own solar system. Um, the, re the reason for this is, is that uh, the economics um, favour this type of distributed application ahead of large centralised ones because uh, you're generating electricity at the point of use where it's more expensive than at the point of uh, you know, large scale generation by fossil fuel generators. So in this case you're, you're sort of competing with the retail price of electricity rather than the wholesale price and there's a factor of four or five difference in the cost between those types of applications. So Australia was one of the first countries to reach this um, million home holder threshold. Uh, Japan was the next, the US is about to reach that threshold now. So um, you know, an early application because of the different economics in using um, photovoltaics in a distributed mode rather than a centralised mode. So this is a chart that was prepared a couple of years ago just showing the um, residential cost of electricity in different countries of the world versus the amount of su um, sunlight received in the world and Australia is there. Somewhere there's Australia and the size of the circle represents the size of the residential electricity market. And these lines here represent the um, economic cost of solar generated electricity. So the more sunshine, whoops, the more the more sunshine you have, the cheaper it is to generate the solar electricity for fairly obvious reasons. So um, Australia, the um, solar systems became economic quite early on, but as the cost of the photovoltaics have come down, more and more countries, uh, this type of application becomes economic. So there's Turkey there, so not much different from Australia. So this is an area now where photovoltaics should be competitive in that type of application. Uh, Japan is another big user in this type of application. Germany doesn't get much sunlight, but electricity has always been expensive there, so the solar has been able to compete in these residential applications for, um, for many years. So historically, the cost of the solar has been coming down, so this, this line has been moving down in this direction, capturing more and more of the, of the um, world market for this distributed, small-scale use of solar. So the next type of application that becomes economic and is already economic in uh, countries like Australia is, is, is sort of commercial use, where you're again generating at the point of use, in this case a, a warehouse or something or other, or I think this is the Google complex in California. So, so offices are a good type of application because they use a lot of energy during the daytime and relatively little at night. So it's an application that's well suited for solar. So that's a larger scale application that as the cost of the solar has kept reducing, these start then becoming competitive. But um, you know, the ultimate application is large scale generation and, um, and the, the solar is now starting to reach the cost where these are becoming economic. So these are some early large systems that were put in. This one's in Germany, this one's in here in Germany. And here you're just supplying electricity to the electricity distribution network, you know, much the same as this conventional generator shown here. So this is an application where you're starting to do the job of these traditional generators that, um, tradi that uh, tend to burn a lot of fossil fuels and hence are contributing to the um, carbon levels in our atmosphere and the consequences that arise from them. Uh, this is a system in California where um, there's been encouragement of the, the use of uh, systems, large systems of this type. This is an important slide. This shows the cost of electricity in that type of application versus a timeline. And it's sort of over the last uh, uh, eight or nine years of this timeline. But um, back in the early stages, systems that were installed like this weren't economically competitive. So this is a large system that went in in the US. This is the price of the electricity um, generated. In, in these big systems, uh, the, the model adopted in the US has been power purchase agreements where the company installing the system um, installs it under a contract whereby it gets paid for the electricity produced over a generally 15 or 20 year period. So this is the uh, negotiated price for the electricity produced from the system. So, um, you know, if, if the company is going to make money from the, installing the system, this is an economic price for the electricity produced. 
So just, um, you know, like seven or eight years ago, the cost of solar was, was up here at $200 a megawatt hour, which is a, you know, a, a unit for electricity uh, energy. Um, so 200 uh, is quite high, 50 is a more reasonable type of um, price for the generation cost of electricity from a large coal-fired power station. So as you can see, um, you know, very rapidly the cost of the photovoltaics has come down and um, if we go to some recent installations, this is um, not very clear probably from where you're sitting, but these little bars here are a continuation of this chart showing how costs have come down even further. And the, the most recent price was for a system in Dubai, which is 29.90 per megawatt hour, so somewhere around here. So getting below the price of any other source of electricity. So um, for the cost of uh, fossil fuel generation, generally the quoted price would be $40 a megawatt hour or something in that range. For nuclear, it's, it's, it's much higher. So um, for the Hinkley system in the UK that's received a lot of press lately, the negotiated price was somewhere over $100 per megawatt hour. So we're talking about um, systems that are already you know, lower in cost than the traditional sources of electricity. So not many people are aware of this because, you know, it's all happened very quickly. We're just talking about the last five years. So anyone that last looked at the technology five years ago would have a different perspective on costs from what they are, are now. So it's just been a, a revolution in, in uh, uh, the cost of the technology. So we're now at the stage where it's, you, know, you could say it's as cheap as anything else, but the costs are still coming down. So it's clearly going to be the lowest cost electricity production option you know, in five or 10 years down the track. Um, so some people have, have realized that this is occurring. So these are just some projections by Bloomberg, which is sort of a market um, analysis company. Um, well, they do a lot of market analysis. But this is uh, new electricity generation capacity being installed worldwide. So it, there's some historical data and then projections shown here. So the blue is wind energy, which has been the, the main source of renewable energy that's been installed in the past. The, is, the yellow is solar photovoltaics and the blue is uh, hydroelectricity. So these are the renewable or sustainable forms of electricity generation. But what's anticipated is the Renewable forms of energy will grow, as indicated here, particularly the solar, becoming increasingly part of large part of the new generation capacity that's installed worldwide. While the traditional forms have uh, been uh, tending to decrease, as coal and gas generate electricity, so that trend is expected to continue. So these will gradually get phased out due to, um, uh, I guess, more and more constraints on the burning of fossil fuels. So we get, we're, we're, we're in a transition period where uh, the traditional sources of electricity have been starting to be replaced by solar electricity. And, wh and what's driving it is a reduction in the cost of these solar panels. So this, um, the top line here shows the average selling price of these modules. So again, we're over a similar eight or nine year period, but the cost has come down you know, by a factor of um, seven or so from this era here. So over seven years, the price has reduced by a factor of seven. So you can see the price. Um, the, the, this is just different components within the price, but this is the average selling price, this upper line here. So it comes down very dramatically. So this is, the, this is what's driving um, you know, the, the transition. And if we look at um, recent experience, um, you know, the price is still, still is coming down. And over the last three years, it's been reducing at 12% a year. So, as I said before, already uh, competitive with most sources of electricity generation in terms of the generation costs, but going to become uh, even lower in cost as time goes on. So we're sort of in a, in a transition. This shows a different type of tra uh, transition, a uh, transport uh, transition. This is Fifth Avenue in New York and East uh, uh, 1900. And you can see all the vehicles here are horse-drawn. And if you look very carefully, you can find one motor vehicle um, in this image, just where I've shown it circle. So um, if we look at a similar image, 13 years down the track, this is the same Fifth Avenue, and um, dominated by motor vehicles. 
And if you look very carefully, you can find one horse in this image. So it shows that these types of revolutions can occur very quickly, and I think this is what we're going to see in the energy area. Very rapid transition from a, a, an energy generation system very dependent on fossil fuels to one that more sustainable energy sources are, um, are being used. So how quickly could this transition occur? Um, this was a study that was published by um, the German Advisory Council on Global Change in 2003. The, the basic study was, undone, was done a couple of years earlier and they just examined scenarios of how the world might transition from a world in 2000 that was very heavily dependent on fossil fuels, this is oil, coal and gas, um, these regions down the bottom here, how we might tr uh, transition over this century to a more sustainable world. And so this was their um, modelling of how that might be done. But um, their conclusion was if you looked at the amount of energy that the world was likely to need by the end of this century, which is about four times more than at the beginning, um, the only source of sustainable uh, energy generation that was available in the quantity that was likely to be required was solar. So they uh, based the, their exemplary transition scenario on a, on a solar world with um, about a quarter of our primary energy being supplied by solar by uh, 2050 and uh, you know the vast majority, about two thirds by, um, by the end of the century. So I guess in a nutshell their conclusion was if, if we're going to switch to a sustainable energy, ge uh, energy generation that doesn't involve CO2 emissions that uh, are going to increasingly pollute the atmosphere, um, the only source that's likely to be able to supply energy in the quantities required um, is, the, um, is the solar energy. So this was a very uh, bold projection for the era in which it was made in that there was virtually no solar installed. Like you can see the yellow region um, you know, doesn't open up and, and hardly um, you know, any um, of the world's energy was being produced by solar in the year 2000 when these projections were made. But if we look at how we're actually comparing against the projections uh, that were made in that study, I've plotted the same information here but on a logarithmic graph so the red lines you can see in this graph are the projections that were used in that previous study for uh, wind, uh, solar and uh, nuclear energy. And the green dots show how we're progressing against those projections. So if, uh, in the case of solar, if you follow this projection through to 2050, you get to this 25% of the world's primary energy by mid-century, which um, I guess many people, when this, when this study was done, would have uh, found that, um, you know, very difficult to believe that we could make a transition of that magnitude over that type of time scale. But if you look at the progress uh, for the case of wind, for example, we're sticking pretty much to that projection um, in terms of the, the rate of installation of wind capacity. Um, this was a German study, so it wasn't particularly keen on nuclear, and in fact nuclear has not grown even as rapidly as was projected there, and there's been a couple of uh, issues with nuclear that I think uh, most would be aware, with, but in the, aware of, but in the case of photovoltaics it's been the, the opposite. Things have grown very rapidly, and actually um, at the end of uh, 2013 we we're actually where the study was projection would be in 2020, so actually seven years ahead of the schedule. So this vast transformation of the way we generate energy that um, you know, would seem um, you know, on the verge of being ridiculous when the forecast was made, it now looks like we're in a good position to actually meet that type of forecast and actually get there even a little bit sooner. Okay, so um, you know, what do we need to uh, transform the way that we generate um, energy and you know one thing is a lot more cells and that seems to be happening the, as we saw we're deploying cells much more quickly than was anticipated in that very ambitious study even. We need the cost to continue reducing and as I've shown that's still occurring and I'll talk a little bit about the technolo technological things that are occurring that are likely to see that continue to happen and then um, we run into an issue um, you know, fossil generators are best um, when they're running constantly. Um, that's when they're used uh, most efficiently and economically. 
But with solar, of course, you only get the solar electricity during the daytime, you don't get it at night time, and you still want to use electricity at night time. So you get an issue with solar where matching the supply and demand. So finding a solution for that is um, you know, it's one important thing. So I'll talk about a bit about that as well. Okay, so one way of matching, that, that's one of the most important issues. So that I'll just talk quickly about a couple of ways that people are exploring to uh, provide that. So hopefully it won't provide a bottleneck in this uh, transition that I mentioned. So energy storage is one way to make that uh, demand and the energy storage, storage area has been given a big push by uh, Elon Musk. So it's amazing how one person can make such a huge difference. But he's really promoted the idea of um, development of cheap batteries, um, initially for electrical vehicles, but also for a storage of uh, solar and wind generated electricity. So there's expected to be big developments in batteries. So the type of cost reductions that we've seen in solar have largely come about through increased uh, capacity, increased volume of production and so on. So it's anticipated that similar volume increases in batteries that may occur through electric vehicles and through the use of batteries on private homes and so on to store electricity, we'll see the price of batteries drop very rapidly and this become a viable option for storing uh, energy. So uh, Elon's building this big factory in um, Nevada, I think, um, that's um, nearing completion, I believe. The other big change that might occur and that Elon is helping uh, develop is um, you know, the introduction of electric vehicles and uh, the other big change that occurring is driverless vehicles. So I, you know, I read an article the other day that was uh, claiming that we might be forbidden from, humans might be forbidden from driving cars you know, not too, in the not too distant future and that these driverless cars might prove safer than, um, than human driven cars. So I, I think that's, um, that's a revolution that we uh, may also see is the transition from human driven cars to uh, automatically driven cars. And these may well be electrically, um, electrically charged. And I think I'm not sure how um, much of an impact Uber has made here in uh, Turkey, but uh, certainly in Australia, you know, it shows that we, this era that, we've, um, that has dominated over the last century where, where uh, ownership, private ownership of cars has been the norm. Um, we may be entering an era where car ownership is, is no longer essential if you feel confident you can just use your phone to uh, call up a driverless car, hop into it and it's optimally scheduled for the next person to, to use and so on. So there may be a big, big revolution in the way that we, um, that we use vehicles and this may um, also uh, um, provide some of the storage that we might need for uh, a solar powered world for example. So uh, uh, these vehicles uh, could well be electric and, um, and, uh, and use electricity that's generated from solar and uh, have storage batteries to um, tide them over and night time use for example. The, the cheapest way of storing electricity now is um, pumped hydro storage. So this shows the basic idea when you've got excess electricity you um, use pumps in a station like this to pump water uphill to a dam uphill and then when you, um, when you need extra electricity, you let the water run downhill and turn turbines in the station here that then generate electricity. So this, this, is the, this is the largest type of storage that's presently used in our electricity supply network, this pumped hydro storage. So increasing uh, hydroelectric storage is, is, is one way of, um, another way many people are interested in for meeting the increased energy storage requirements of a solar powered world. There's other ways as well. Um, um, pumping water up here uh, is pumping against this uh, pressure of this head here, but there's other ways of providing pressurized storage that people have talked about, um, such as pressurizing um, bladders by piling um, earth or sand over the top, as indicated in this diagram here or submerging um, balloons like this deep underwater that pressurizes the story. So there's a lot of um, interest in finding alternative ways of uh, providing sort of what I would describe as mechanical means of energy storage, as well as the chemical ones that batteries provide. 
And the other way you can address the, um, the lack of match between generation and demand is by pumping electricity around the world. And uh, this, um, this is, is not as unfeasible as it might sound in that the world's electricity networks are increasingly becoming uh, more interconnected. So this was a Desertec scheme that was um, talked about very prominently here about five years ago, whereby North Africa would be connected to Europe and taking advantage of the gas supplies and solar supplies from North Africa to power the European network. Um, there's long been talk about connections across the Bering Strait to connect uh, uh, connect America and uh, Asia and hence Europe. There's talk about a, a, a grid uh, connecting uh, Northeast Asia and um, this is probably one of the more ambitious schemes that, talk, that have been talked about but this gentleman here, uh, Mr Liu, is the, um, has been until recently the president of the world's largest power company, the state, state grid authority of uh, China and he's talked very um, positively about connecting China over to Europe so it's such that the vast resources of solar and wind in the uh, western provinces of China can be used to provide electricity. In fact, I've written a book about it. And um, this, this uh, mightn't be all that relevant were it not for the fact that straight grid, state grid of China has some of the longest interconnections of this type um, in existence worldwide at the moment. So as power electronics improve, this type of transmission becomes less and less costly and uh, more and more vi viable. And uh, some of my colleagues in Australia have talked about connections between Australia and Asia, and uh, they reckon the cost of doing that is not all that insurmountable. So this uh, group here has just sort of linked all this up and, you know, so this, uh, this idea of a uh, solar, so sort of an electrically interconnected world is not all that um, absurd with the developments in technology that are, are occurring. So the basic idea is that, um, you know, if you've got the whole world interconnected, if it's night time in uh, Europe, it's going to be daytime in Australia. So you just pump the uh, electricity that's being generated by solar in Australia to, to where it's needed. So electricity is being generated around the clock and used around the clock in that type of interconnected scenario. And then the other way of matching um, supply and demand is by controlling demand. And I think this is something that's almost certainly going to happen. You know, it's a bit like the Uber vehicles where you're using your phone to control your transport needs. I think, um, you know, like in household loads and so on, these are very amenable to similar control. So you don't need your refrigerator working around the clock. You can just have it working when electricity is abundantly available and so on. So by being able to control your home appliances, um, you know, you're going to be able to better match electricity supply and demand. So this is just um, a scheme in Ontario that's sort of promoting that use. Okay, and then the generation of uh, gaseous or liquid fuels is the other thing that's talked about. So you can use the excess electricity when it's available from solar panels, for example, to hydrolyze water to create hydrogen. This is an idea that's been talked about for decades, but um, it's still looking increasingly viable as the cost of these electrolyzers decrease and so on. Then you can use the hydrogen to drive fuel cells to power aircraft or whatever. So that um, this is still a very active region of research. Or well, the other idea is to convert uh, compounds containing um, to, to produce liquid fuels by converting CO2 to, um, to liquid fuels such as methanol shown here. So this is also an active area of research. So, you know, using um, the solar to um, capture CO2 and convert it to a, a useful fuel. What I'd like to finish my talk doing is talking a little bit about technology, which is really where my expertise lies. But, um, you know, like just going through the steps of making a, a silicon solar cell, the source material is um, what's called polysilicon material. Silicon is a very abundant material. It's the second most abundant uh, element in the Earth's crust after oxygen. So there's plenty of it there, but the problem is it's uh, usually tied up with oxygen. So separating the uh, oxygen from the silicon is, uh, 
is the first step in, um, in producing silicon. And then you have to purify it to very high levels because, as I mentioned before, you can control the properties of the silicon by introducing impurities into it. So you want it sort of free of impurities so you can then use impurities to manipulate its property. So producing pure silicon is the first step. And then uh, after you've produced the pure silicon, you put it in a pot like this and melt it. And then you produce a big block of solid silicon from the melt, such as shown here. And then you slice the, this big block up into uh, smaller bricks, as shown here. And this is like a loaf of bread. You then slice this up to get the wafers. So this is obviously you know, quite a complex process. And um, you know, 10, 20 years ago, people thought that it was always going to be expensive because it, you know, obviously it's you know, not a very streamlined way of making a large area of silicon. But with the um, economies of scale that we've seen, um, develop over the last decade, the cost of doing all this has been um, reduced very dramatically and you can now buy these silicon wafers for um, you know, very low prices. Um, yeah, and then you, you're slicing this up at the wafer, you then process it into the cells that I talked about earlier on. This is um, just the ingots being produced, these are photos of actual ones. But what's been happening in this area is that these ingots have been getting bigger and bigger. So 2,000, you know, th these are quite heavy, like 300 kilograms, um, don't try lifting that on your own. But, um, you know, that, that was a big ingot back in 2000. By 2006, you know, the size of a big ingot had doubled. And, um, you know, that's what's happening within the production now. This is just showing the size of the ingot over time and how it's expected to grow. So just by making these ingots bigger and bigger, you're, starting, you're reducing the cost of the silicon that's, um, that's produced from them. So this is like an incremental way of steadily reducing the cost and contributing to that 12% a year cost reduction that I mentioned. You know, so um, I'm not sure where it's going to finish. This was me with a, a large crucible that represents the current state of the art, a generation, what's called a generation eight ingot. And just a couple of weeks ago, I was able to photograph uh, uh, the largest ingot I'd seen, which is about a two-ton ingot. So, uh, so from 2000 to 2016, we've gone from a 200 kilogram ingot to a two-ton ingot, so a factor of 10 increase in size. And uh, you know, I'm not sure where it's going to stop. These ingots are just going to get bigger and bigger, which which lowers the cost of the silicon that's being produced. So, a surefire way of continuing the cost reduction. Um, these little photos here show the cross-section of one of these ingots and the blue regions are the good quality regions and the red regions are the poor quality regions and they tend to lie around the edges of the ingot. But by making the ingots bigger, you increase the volume of good material. So, you know, not only do you make the material cheaper, but you get more of it by making the ingots bigger. So, you know, another contributor to the cost reduction. Something as trivial as sawing the uh, ingot up can have a big impact on the cost. So this is the technique that's used now. So it's like slicing bread, but you slice it with um, essentially piano wires that are wound around um, these spools that you can see here. So this is the process that has historically been used where the piano wires guide a slurry through this um, brick to, to give you, this is the, ultimately the wafers. But just by going to a slightly different approach, diamond impregnated wires, it's been found you can saw the wafers much more quickly and with much less wastage. Like you're grinding through this material, you waste all the silicon in each region. So something as simple as that can have a big impact on the economics. So as this technology gets introduced more widely in production, the cost of the wafers are going down just due to that. So a fairly simple technological improvement that's um, you know, contributing to reduced cost. The other thing that's uh, contributing to reduced cost is the energy conversion efficiency. And this is where the research done by my group uh, comes in. So this is a historical plot of the best laboratory cell efficiency. So this is the efficiency is the conversion rate of the solar cell. So this shows a solar cell, in fact, one of our early ones. And the efficiency is the ratio of the electrical power that you get from this cell compared to the amount of sunlight energy falling on it, the sunlight power falling on it. 
So um, you know, you, you can measure the amount of energy in the sunlight and you can measure the amount of energy the cell's producing and the ratio is the efficiency. So my group, as was mentioned, started in the 1970s and at that time the best um, efficiencies by present standard was about 17%. It was the best you could do with a silicon cell and our um, research took it to uh, 25% um, as, was, as was mentioned. Um, so the, the cell technology I spoke a little bit about before, but you use these positive negative junctions. So this um, P-type region has been positive region. It has one type of impurity. In fact, boron introduces the silicon control quantities. And then you have an N-type negative region that's shown red here, where you introduce another type of impurity, in this case, uh, phosphorus. And the junction between the phosphorus regions and the boron regions give you that PN junction that William Shockley uh, described the theory of, and, and that's what gives you the, the asymmetry that creates the cell action. Um, yeah, this is a standard commercial cell shown here that um, was developed in the 1970s, about the time that our research group started. So the, most of the cells that have been made up to now have actually been made using technology that was known to the industry in the 1970s. So it's just been a matter of scaling up that industry, up, up that technology and perfecting it that's produced the costs that we've um, seen. But um, yeah, I'll just skip over this, but our, our, one of our claims to fame is um, developing the first 20% efficient cell. This is a group of young guys that, um, that developed that technology but they've had a big impact on the industry, particularly in China. So the, one of the reasons the cost has come down quickly is China was able to scale up the production and reduce the costs of manufacturing very dramatically. And a lot of these people here were key to, um, to actually transferring the technology that we developed into China. Our 25% cell structure is now being adopted by the industry. So although the industry now, up to recently, has used um, standard, has used the technology that was available in the 70s, it's now moving on to the more sophisticated technology that we required to take the efficiency from 17% up to uh, 25%. I won't go into the details of that, but this, is, this shows the fraction of new manufacturing capacity that's using our technology, which is the red region here. So over the next few years, the industry will switch from using the, the old technology to the new. So we'll see efficiencies of the panels keep in, increasing, and that decreases the cost, because for a given amount of wafer and module, glass, etc., you get more power. So it reduces the cost of the energy produced. The industry um, steadily pushing to higher and higher efficiencies. So uh, presently, the industry is producing cells of about 20% efficiency, but it's expected that the industry will go up and up in efficiency. So 25% will be quite the norm within a five or 10 years time scale. If we look at the basic thermodynamics, so going back to a bit of physics, if you um, look at the energy from the sun and the, the characteristics of that energy, you can work out what is the maximum efficiency that you can convert sunlight. And you get two different answers compared to what bit of the sunlight you look at. So if you look at the sunlight just coming from the sun's disk, that one there, you can get a very high efficiency, um, about 93%. And the reason for that is that that light is all coming from the same direction. So that, because you know, have that information about the light, it allows you to convert it more efficiently. But if you look at the whole sky, if you um, say, I, I don't want to just convert the light coming from the sun's disk, I want to convert the light coming from all possible directions, you end up with a, a, a slightly higher efficiency, 74%. So as I mentioned, we, we developed a 25% efficient cell, but if you look at the basic physics, we should really be talking about cells that are 70% efficient, and, that, and that's due to a deficiency in the way the, the cells operate. You can't do much better than 25% with a silicon cell, but it's sort of showing that that's not the ultimate cell technology because physics is telling you you should be able to get at least 75%. I won't, I won't go into that one there. So, um, you know, there's been various ways suggested for 
for bridging that gap between you know, what a silicon cell can do and what thermodynamics say you should be able to convert sunlight and what efficiency you should be able to achieve. But this way here has been the most effective and it just involves stacking cells made from different materials on top of one another. So if you stack a cell that's uh, responsive to blue light, the, the silicon cell itself is best with uh, red light or infrared light, um, light way down the infrared end of the solar spectrum. But if you stack a cell that's um, responsive to blue sunlight, so blue sunlight in involves high energy photons, um, you know, that's the light that gives you sunburn and so on. It's the damaging high energy photons that are, that are constituents of the blue light. So if you use a cell that's specialised in converting those high energy photons, um, allow sunlight to fall on it, it'll absorb those blue energy photons but allow lower energy photons, the, the green and the, infra and the infrared and so on, to pass through to the next most cell. So you use a cell that's specialised in converting the green cells underneath it, it'll automatically get the green light directed to it by this automatic filtering type approach that goes on. And then you can have your silicon cell at the bottom that then can convert the red and infrared wavelengths. So it turns out by partitioning the sunlight in that way, you can approach that 75% um, efficiency that I mentioned very closely. You can, in principle, get up to 68% by stacking an infinite number of these cells increasingly specialised cells on top of one another. Um, but stacking an infinite number is probably not practical, but stacking two or three certainly is. So this is the way I think that solar cell technology will develop by stacking, st taking a standard silicon cell that I've shown here, stacking one or two cells made as thin layers on top of the silicon material. So if we uh, look at what efficiency you can get um, this chart here shows the answer. This is the efficiency understand sunlight. If you have one silicon cell, you're stuck with about 30% efficiency. The best you could do with any other material is 33%, it turns out. So silicon's not a bad choice if you just have a single cell. But if you stack um, one cell in, on top of silicon, you can bump the efficiency up from 29% to 42%. So you can get quite a big jump in efficiency by partitioning the sunlight up into two different colour bands. And then stacking uh, three cells, you, um, you can go up to 47% um, as shown here. So stacking cells on top of silicon is one way of bumping up the efficiency. So this is the way I think the industry will go. Rather than just using a silicon cell, it will start using these cell stacks, pushing the efficiency higher and higher. So we got to 25%. You know, this is a practical efficiency compared to the theoretical ideal. We got to 25% with um, practical cells. If you can get the same fraction of that you know, thermodynamically um, available performance, you end up with cells that are over 40% efficiency. So whereas solar panels now, the best you can buy commercially are you know, just slightly over 20% efficiency, further down the track, the efficiency may go up to 40%, so you'll just need half the area of panel to get the same energy output. So that brings me to the um, end of my talk, so thanks for bearing with me. But uh, a couple of points I wanted to make. Um, the solar costs are low. They're already as low as with any other technology. If you're building a new power plant, solar is as low as cost as you get with any other technology. But the thing about solar is whereas the costs of most other energy sources are going up, the cost of solar is going down. And because of those relatively uh, simple technological improvements I mentioned, we can expect that to continue at least for the next, next decade or so. So within the next five or ten years, it's going to be clearly the lowest cost option for electricity generation. So the start of an energy transformation, those low costs are going to kickstart an energy transformation, which I think is already underway, uh, similar to that what we saw in um, transport at the you know, similar stage of the last century. Um, going to be an increasing need to match the generation because of the solar availability only during the daytime, increasing need to match generation to the load. Historically the opposite occurred because fossil fuel generators work best around the clock. Countries have sought to increase nighttime loads to provide a more balanced load for the fossil fuel generators. 
we've got to stop all that and go back to um, increasing the demand for, for power during the daytime. And I've, I've talked about various ways of addressing that mismatch. So plenty of room for new opportunities. There's going to be um, very many new industries that uh, arise, many new companies that arise, many new technologies required as a result of this energy transformation that we're going through. So thank you very much for your attention. That's the end of the talk. Thank you very much for this very nice and informative talk. Uh, we will have a few questions. If you have any questions, please raise your hand. Sachu. Uh, thank you for thank you for the nice thank you for the nice presentation. Uh, the question is, uh, as you are very, very much aware of the perovskite solar cells, they came from in 2009 and all of a sudden it's a big boost. And uh, for tandem, as you suggested, on top of silicon, we need a bank of about 1.7, 1.9 electron mole. And do you think that this will be a completed new material that will take us to there, or it will be a small modification of the materials that we have so far? What's your opinion on that? Shall we just keep looking on the new material? which is a band gap which is su uh, suitable for silicon to use in the tandem, or we just, you think it's already achieved with one of the materials that we have in our hand already? Yes, uh, thank you very much for the question. Yes, yeah, so um, a new material has suddenly emerged um, within the solar area, and uh, it's a perovskite. So perovskite's a well-known mineral, but this is a very special type of perovskite that um, uh, has, has almost ideal properties for photovoltaics. Uh, so we've been looking at the perovskites um, in, in terms of stacking thin layers on top of it, uh, um, on top of silicon, as have other groups worldwide. And some good uh, laboratory results have already been obtained. So I mentioned, you know, we're after 40% type efficiencies with stacking cells on silicon. The best that I've heard of is about 28% efficiency by stacking uh, perovskites. However, um, you know, one requirement for photovoltaics that I didn't really mention during the talk is, is a very long life. And uh, most manufacturers of the silicon panels are presently uh, warranting the modules for 25 years, and um, uh, some even 30 years now. But it's expecting that that warranty period is probably going to increase in the future. So it may go up to, you know, a 50-year warranty. If you, if you look around at commercially available products, you know, there's very few that are warranted for that type of time frame. In fact, I think saucepans is the only one that I've found that have a similar type of warranty. So a much less sophisticated product than, um, than a solar panel. So the problem with the perovskites up to, up to the present at least, and, and no one's sure whether it's going to be a long-term problem or it's just the fact we haven't done enough work, but the problem at the moment is the stability. So. Um, at the moment, most groups find that um, if the perovskite cell lasts a few days, they're doing well, even when it's encapsulated. You know, and the very best might be a few weeks. So we need to find a way of making them a lot more stable. And um, so we're continuing to work on the perovskites in the hope that uh, we or someone else can find a way of making them stable. But we're also uh, looking at other materials just in case uh, stability can't be found uh, with the material. So you could also get rid of the silicon and just stack you know, different perovskite materials on top of another if that technology pans out or, or other semiconductors apart from silicon. Um, but um, the, the route via silicon is attractive just in terms of new product introduction. You can see how an existing manufacturer of silicon could very simply modify their product you know, without having to generate a new market or anything, just modify their product by um, selling a higher efficiency version of it, you know, initially at a premium and then, um, you know, gradually reducing the costs as the market demand picked up. So it's a very um, neat um, market introduction strategy available if you stick with the silicon technology. So that's one of the reasons that it looks attractive, I think. Thank you. Any other question? I have one question. Uh, regarding the tin film system, you have not mentioned uh, anything about tin film systems, the commercially available systems. So their market share is now has been going down. 
for the last uh, 10 years or so. Uh, do you see, I mean, what do you see for the, for the future of uh, tin film system, like our for silicon, cadmium telluride, CAGS and so on? Yes, yeah, so, so as mentioned, um, you don't need to use silicon to make solar cells, you can use um, other, other materials. Um, and there have been um, you know, three other technologies that have been commercialised apart from silicon, although their market share is very much smaller. But one is a, a compound a semiconductor, cadmium telluride. So, um, you know, just talking a little bit about the chemistry, silicon is from um, group four of the periodic table, uh, but uh, cadmium is from group two and tellurium is from group six. But if you average the the group number, you end up with a, a, a sort of a, a group four average. So it's a way of sort of synthesizing a material that's got properties similar to silicon uh, by combining elements from different groups in the periodic table. So, um, so cadmium telluride has been the second most popular choice for solar cells. Um, I, I think there's two limitations with the technology and one is that cadmium, of course, is a very toxic metal and uh, for example, in Europe, um, the restriction on hazardous substance legislation has very tight bounds on the amount of cadmium you are out in any commercial product. At the moment, solar panels have an exemption from that legislation, but it's uncertain as to whether that exemption will be continued indefinitely or not. So it's a bit of a risk with the technology in terms of um, you know, increasing the uh, stringent environmental legislation against the use of heavy metals. And the other challenge is that it involves tellurium. And if you look at the fundamental availability of tellurium, it's very similar to that of gold. So that um, if you're talking about deploying you know, large areas of solar panels covering you know, a fraction of the Earth's surface, um, you, know, you need to cover 1% of the Earth's surface to provide um, you know, all the primary energy that we're presently using you would have difficulty finding enough tellurium to, uh, to, to provide that type of capacity. So, you know, I see it as only a bridging technology because the tellurium availability will limit the long-term applications. So uh, in, there's other materials that, um, you know, have similar limitations. So the other material that's used is called SIGS, C-I-G-S. So it involves, you know, not just two elements, but copper, indium, gallium, and, sel and selenium. So the weak link there is indium and gallium, which are also materials that are not produced in large volume. So you've just got an issue if, if you were to supply increasing amounts of energy from these technologies, you know, what would happen to the price of indium? You know, is there enough indium to support large areas of these panels? So I, I personally think, you know, when, when you're looking for new materials, you need to uh, find materials that avoid issues with toxicity and hence the threat of being um, disallowed due to uh, increasingly stringent environmental legislation or you need to find materials that, and you need to find materials that are abundant so that you don't run into a resource limitation when you're trying to deploy large areas of the panels. So silicon's got a clean bill of health on both accounts and there's other semiconductors that uh, people are working on that uh, also uh, satisfy all requirements in terms of toxicity and, uh, and abundance of the materials. So, um, yeah, so just an important issue um, in, in terms of supplying energy on the scale that, um, that I'm um, anticipating uh, will, will actually uh, eventuate. Thank you. Main final um, talking about this, uh, not mentioning the efficiency, but uh, to come down with the price, and if we go for the uh, organic materials, maybe green tea or something like this, do you have any thoughts to share with us? Let's say low efficiency, but extremely low price and zero toxic. Uh, yes, yes, so that's a very good question. Um, so uh, the, the, you can make solar cells um, not only from silicon and some of the other materials I mentioned, but also from uh, uh, plastic material, organic materials, and, and that's obviously very attractive because um, you know they could be made very simply. Like if you think of um, you know cling wrap or glad wrap or uh, some of these plastic films that are made, you know obviously they can be made very inexpensively. Um, the the main issue has been uh, stability and um, 
and uh, efficiency level. So that, as you mentioned, um, the way around that is if you, you know, you could conceive of systems that you installed very cheaply and only expected them to last five years or something, which would be a very good lifetime for existing volcanic solar cells. Or, or there's special applications like consumer products. I think, um, you know, there's a lot of potential for organics. But I think in terms of, you know, large scale applications, um, the, these large fields operate at, at high voltage. So that places quite stringent, you know, professional requirements about the quality of encapsulation and so on you require that it's difficult to see how you get around with, uh, with organic material. So you're still going to need to have high voltages to keep the cost of the installations down to low cost, the cost of wiring, the panels and so on. So you need to have panels that um, will protect uh, a bypasser from these high voltages. So you need to have like professional encapsulation and so on. So I think that's where the, where the problem lies. But for, for small scale applications um, where you don't have to generate high voltages, I think there could be a you know, very real interest in some of these materials that can be produced very inexpensively like the organic materials. And, th and they've got a you know, clean bill of health on the environmental grounds. There's no, uh, there's no resource or um, toxicity issues with the, with the preferred materials in the organic systems. So yeah, so my take on it is that you might find useful applications and small scale applications. And similarly with things like uh, solar paint and so on, it, you know, it sounds like a very appealing idea and it's appealing to people like Bill Gates, but if you want to generate large amounts of power, um, power is a product of voltage and current. To handle large amounts of current, you need large amounts of copper or aluminium wires that tend to be, get very expensive. So you need to go up in voltage and the human body can only tolerate level, relatively low voltage levels. So you quickly get to lethal voltages if you try to generate large amounts of power. But for small, small scale systems, um, you know, so, some of these um, less expensive technologies, um, you know, may have very real application. With the, with the silicon technology, an interesting point I didn't mention though, but the cost of um, actually encapsulating the silicon cells is the main cost in manufacturing now. In the past, it used to be the cost of making the cell and producing the wafers and that type of thing. But um, with the reduction in the manufacturing costs of the cells themselves, the cost of actually packing, packaging the cell in the solar module is now the most expensive step in the whole manufacturing process. And, and uh, if you address these voltage type and safety issues that I mentioned before, you know, every technology is going to be lumbered with, the, with those same type of packaging costs if you want a professionally packaged product. Um, so in that type of scenario, it turns out that the efficiency of the cell is the most important cell parameter. You know, um, silicon is cheap enough now if you have to professionally package the product. Um, if you can come up with a more efficient technology that has more potential to displace silicon than a low cost one for large scale applications at least. Okay, we have final question now. Oh, yeah. uh, hello Professor, uh, thank you for your presentation uh, first of all. Uh, I'm here as a mechanical engineer and an entrepreneur, so I want to ask you that uh, if you were building a solar farm, for example, two or three megawatts capacity, which type of uh, solar panels would you use? And uh, we all know the amorphous silicon panels uh, were not successful uh, at the past uh, in the mean of lifetime. So what's, what's the chance of the new silicon panels uh, in the, uh, regarding lifetime? Thank you. Yes, um, the, the, I think the issue is fairly uh, clear cut at the moment. So, um, you know, there, there are lots of large solar systems going in now and there's three technologies that are largely being used. The silicon technology is the one that's being used in the largest volume, like over 90% of the panels being installed are silicon. But there's also uh, cadmium telluride and CIGS panels being installed. And, um, you know, so it would be a choice of one of those three technologies. So I, I'd probably go for a high efficiency silicon panel myself because that's my, you know, where, my, um, uh, where my research has, uh, has led me. 
but um, you know, there's um, all manufacturers, all large-scale manufacturers, often offer 25-year warranty on the on the panel output. So um, you know, you you can achieve those type of lifetimes with all three of those technologies. Um, but I think as time goes on, you know, silicon will become probably more dominant rather than less dominant. Thank you very much again. I would like to invite our rector now to give play to Professor Green.